Norman, over the years, I've heard many, many analysts, um, some of them economists, talk about how Canada needs to take a systems approach to energy change, uh, to the energy transition. Uh, but nobody seems to know what systems approach is. Could you maybe tackle that for me? So I'll give you one example. Okay, suppose you want to, uh, to decarbonize building heating. So if I have a single house, I can simply install a heat pump Okay, maybe do some insulation and then change my you know, uh, box, uh, electric box at the entry and I'm okay. Nothing needs to be changed. Now, if I want to decarbonize the full neighborhood or the full province, then this is not sufficient. I need to make sure I increase the electricity production. I need to build transport lines. I need to build distribution lines to change the transformer at the end of the street. I need to make sure that I balance the production with the fact that the demand is shifting for summer to winter. So changing from a single individual to a global or a collective transformation is not simply multiplying the transformation one by one. It's understanding that this will impact everybody else. And so you need to assemble these, uh, these layers of transformation. I would have to say I, I agree with you because, um, you know, here at Energy Media, we interview experts and we, but we also interview entrepreneurs and others who are working in the economy in this area. And one of the, thing, the things that becomes apparent uh, fairly uh, early on is, is that we take a piecemeal approach to this, whereas other economies take a more strategic, whole, holistic view a policy view. And so there are always pieces missing. There are always bottlenecks in Canada that prevent the rollout of new technologies or the, you know, the, the improvement of some of the, you know, the sectors in terms of their energy use. Uh, and I, I don't know what to do with that. What, what would you suggest? How do we change our thinking to a more systems uh, approach? That's what we're recommending. But for this, you need to analyze. And again, the way I described the system was simply in terms of uh, infrastructures, but the system is people also. If you want to deploy, for example, these heat pumps at, le at, at scale, you need to have people who are trained who can install them properly. You need to have the supply chain so that you can repair them. You need to have the supply chain for building the transformer, the people. I mean, this is a complex way. And what we're proposing is that we need to do this analysis. We've done some of it, but it's not at the final detail and then we decide how do we want to launch this do we want to say we're building it region by region sector by sector how do we approach this to make sure that we have the right flux of electricity we have the right investment we have the right people there and this needs to be planned and that's why i mean canada doesn't know how to plan stuff again we imagine when you look at the the the, the in emission reduction plan, we had only a plan for putting heat pumps in houses, but without any link about anything else, about what does that mean for training? What does that mean for infrastructure? What does that mean for electricity? So same thing for EVs. The way we're planning the EVs is totally disconnected from what's the need on the ground for this. How do we build infrastructure? How do we make sure we have a charger? How do we handle safety? If everybody is electric heating and transport, in the winter there's no electricity or whatever, how do you handle safety? This is not a reason for not electrifying. It's a reason for planning the system and understanding what that means. And Norman, um, uh, Prime Minister Mark Carney has promised that in the next federal budget, which will be coming down on November 4th, so I mean, we're, we're, we're literally days away, from seeing it, and he's promised that there will be a robust industrial policy uh, that comes that's introduced in, uh, along with it. And I have to say, uh, out of all the prime ministers uh, that I've ever you know lived under, uh, having a, an Oxford-trained economist, uh, I, I actually think he knows what industrial policy is. So, are you hopeful that um, that when the budget is is introduced, that we will see the federal government? actually pivot and be able to do systems-based analysis and policy? Well, I would hope so. I, that's why we're putting this report and that's why we're pushing because the machine itself is not equipped for that. We, the, the, the responsibilities are distributed across uh, departments and ministries in a way that is not compatible with this transformation. 
So that's also part of the challenge. I mean, somebody is responsible for only a little bit of it, and other ministry is responsible for the other bit. How do you assemble? How do you attach this? If you do these industrial policies, you have to make choices. You have to say, I'll be supporting this, I'll be pushing this away. This is so un-Canadian. <laughs> and it's very difficult. No, I'll just give you an example. In China, for example, for the EVs, initially they supported a lot of companies. But when a company didn't deliver, they just let it die and move to the next one. Okay? In Canada, letting die is something we cannot do. Okay? We can, so encouraging competition and saying, well, if you don't reach that uh, milestone, well, tough luck, you know, we'll go with those who know how to deliver. Uh, that would be a very strategic approach. I don't know if Canada can do that. We have uh, here at Energy Media, we have a kind of a, a three-point strategy for the economy. And I'd like to get your approach because that, we, it's, tr it's our attempt to take a systems approach to the pivot away from the United States that, that the Prime Minister is talking about. And it has three components. So the first one is add value to natural resources. Don't send raw logs or raw oil or raw gas or raw canola. Send, add value to it in some way. That's number one. Number two, uh, electrify everything, electrify all the processes because that is the most efficient way or very soon will be the most efficient way to do economic activities. And the third one is then build out the infrastructure to support items one and two because we don't have a lot of that infrastructure. I mean, so mm -hmm. uh, just your response to that. Time, of course, but we also have to see where can we position ourselves. For example, heat pumps, uh, for industry and manufacturing. Almost nobody in the world is doing it very at scale. So it's still very much artisanal. Maybe China is moving away from that, but even in Europe, there's no integrated knowledge. So if Canada was serious, and we have a very diverse industrial and manufacturing basic, we could use this to say, let's develop the know-how. This know-how is high value because Putting a heat pump in an industry means we have to understand the whole flux of energy, of heat. We have to control it. We have to make sure the heat pump is well installed. It manages how do you lower the, the, the cost? How do you improve the process with this? This is something that requires knowledge, software, uh, control, all type of things that we could master. We don't master the heat pump. We'll buy them, we'll assemble them, but we can master the other added value to this. But if we don't move now, in five years from now, well, we'll just buy the knowledge and we won't have any additional leverage, additional benefit from this transformation. Same thing in transportation. For kind of individual EVs, it's done, okay? We are not there, we don't control any technology. We have no, I mean, no intellectual property. We never talk about this. But what about the other sector? We have a huge mining industry. The mining industry could be a leverage for off-road transportation, electrification of off-road uh, for mining, for maybe forests and all this. This means we, we can have a role there, develop an industry. This is niche. We have less competition. And this is also what we have to understand that this transformation, we have the mainstream where we might not be there. But if we leverage all this correctly, we might be able to find another niche where we leverage this know-how, where we develop some intellectual property and added value. Um, we've done a lot of work on uh, what China is electrifying in its transportation sector. And the, a lot of the focus around electric vehicles is about cars. Uh, but in fact, the emerging uh, sectors that are, uh, should be of most interest to Canada are the medium duty vehicles, the heavy duty vehicles, like class eight long haul trucks, mm -hmm and other assorted equipment. You could be like an excavator, for example, on a, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and vehicles, specialty vehicles that work in areas like natural resources, like in forestry or mining or whatever it might, it might yeah. be, and, and operate in a cold climate. That's a very, all of that argues for expertise that exists in Canada that could be applied to all of these different technologies. And we could carve a niche up. We don't have to make 50 million cars a year like, like China does, but we maybe we make half a million of very specific electric vehicles that do things that nobody else can, can do. Yeah. And that would be a strategy. And that is not our, the way we approach this. 
I totally agree. Those are strategies. Uh, Canada suffers from a number of issues. First, our infrastructures are much more expensive than elsewhere in the world. Okay? Building a subway, for example, in Canada costs eight to ten times more than in France. The same subway. Okay? There are issues. How can we develop our infrastructures? How can we build what we need to support this? But I think this is something we need to focus as we embark on this transition. We need to understand why we are so inefficient at transforming. Why does it take so long to make a decision? And in that sense, this is not a way of saying let's chip at environment and other issues, but we need to get efficiency in this transformation to be able to really leverage these fruits, these possibilities. We need to change regulation. In many cases in Canada, we lag behind the rest of the world because we are not able to open up kind of a, you know, sandboxes where we can try things, where we can say, okay, we don't know if it's dangerous or not, we don't know, how to, let's open the possibility to explore and then we'll adjust the regulation. That means that in terms of vehicles, for example, we are behind because we just cannot allow this innovation. So we can do the initial development in lab, but the, when we say, okay, can I sell, can I put one on the ground and test? Well. You cannot. And this is a major issue, and that's part of our, recommend, our recommendation. We need to analyze all the barriers to innovation in this transition to electricity. That leads to a conversation about innovation ecosystems. And the Americans have been very good at this over the years. The Chinese are now, I would argue, the undisputed leaders. Their innovation ecosystem is beyond uh, anything we can even comprehend here in, in Canada. But we that's been part of that is because we don't have one or we have a very underdeveloped one. Yeah. And one of the components of that is to accept failure. And the Americans are very good at this. And, and even the Chinese are very good at this. You know, we're going to have some companies that are going to compete and we will support them. But not all of them are going to succeed. And if they fail, that's OK. We, we've learned what are those lessons? How do we integrate that into the next and away we go. And here in Canada, we it's front page news if a government supported company doesn't make it. And would you are would you agree that Canada has to change its attitude towards innovation and failure? Yes. But for this is that we need to stop putting all our eggs in a single basket. Okay. For example, we decided a few years ago that battery was where we had to invest. And I've been trying to convince now and get attention on the fact that we need innovation in the electricity sector, the grid and all this. And there was no interest. The only thing we can do is batteries. So we need to be strategic and to say, let's target a few. Let's drop. When it's failing, no, let's not extend forever. Now, if we don't see a way out, you drop it and you move. So you need to be a bit more brutal. Canada is not very brutal, so we put a lot of eggs, and when we fail, we fail miserably. But in part, we don't learn, we don't recover from this, because we don't structure these losses in such a way that they can be leveraged for other transformation, other gains. Also, we have no market creation vision. So we fund a lot of startups in Canada, okay? but these startups mostly die, because the day they have a product to sell, we tell them, how many have you sold? Well, zero. Well, I cannot buy it. Okay. So we have no strategy to say, how do we create the market? And essentially, most of the companies who succeed in Canada have to go to the US to create their original market. And if they decide not to move to the US, then a few years later, we can have something decent in Canada. So we need to be able to be much more integrated in the way we see this uh, uh, th this industrial policy, not simply a way of supporting innovation and supporting the first, uh, the first step. When we attracted the battery manufacturer, for example, we asked not to dime from them for intellectual property. We could have told, no, we're giving you up to $7 billion. In, so you have to put 500 million of your dollars in universities, in research center, in industry in Canada. We didn't say that. We said, come in, hire people, we'll push a few buttons, and we're happy. We'll lend you, we'll give you a, a big patch of land, and that's all we require. We have no vision about how these investments should trickle down or trickle up in some way in uh, innovation, in attaching and strengthening Canada. 
Uh, let me uh, talk about some of the work that uh, the interviews that we've done with people like uh, Bloomberg NEF's head of mining. Uh, so he, two, three years ago, when I interviewed him, he said, look, you know, Canada's got all kinds of critical minerals. What what the world doesn't have, but China is, is, is the smelting and refining into battery metals. He said, so that's your competitive advantage if you move right away. So you take the minerals and you smelt them and refine them into battery metals. And then you take the battery metals and you transform them into battery cells. And then you take the battery cells and you turn them into battery packs. And then the battery packs go into electric vehicles. And you've essentially, you've captured most of the supply chain in, in the battery industry. And we're still not, we're still struggling with it. We say we have a critical mineral strategy, but we really don't. All we have is a strategy to to support mines that will produce critical minerals. This is complicated. Quebec has been trying to do this with lithium, for example, but now we have no, the GM who said, well, I won't be putting these materials together. So uh, Rio Tinto says, I won't be building the comp the the the, the the, the, the manufacturing plan that will fabricate the, the uphill uh, product based on nickel and based on lithium that we have up there. So these streams are very hard to structure, especially when you don't own and when there's no Canadian companies around and where you have multiple small players who all try to make no, to survive. In China, you have an integrated chain, which means that if the price of lithium drops, well, the mine loses money, but the battery manufacturer makes money and it's really the same industry. So you just shift profits around. In Canada, we have a number of small companies who each need to make profit. And anytime you have a link that dies, it kills the whole system. So we need to be much more I mean, imaginative in how we structure this to make sure we have a number of players at each level so we can balance and make sure that a single company that goes belly up doesn't kill the whole process. And we've been so narrow in the way we think about this that we have not been able to structure this chain properly. And it's not new. It's been going on for you know, 80 years in Canada where we've been you know, planning to have a, a lot of transformation of the natural resources and we haven't done it. Uh, Norman, another fascinating discussion. Thank you very much for your insights. It was a pleasure.